opinions. I'm Romeo. Hey there, I'm Brooke. I'm Demi. And I'm Melissa. On today's report, internal probe into Breonna Taylor's killing releases new findings. Congress member James Clyburn says he's willing to compromise on qualified immunity and a South Carolina city council makes black history. We'll tell you why gas prices are set to rise. Plus, Americans set another post-pandemic travel record and we're going to look back on a special moment in black history. A rock and roll Hall of Famer has died. The Obamas make a sad announcement over the weekend and Oprah and Prince Harry team up for mental health. We have all of that and so much more. So if you're ready, it's our voice and our truth. So let's get it. To me, this reeks of conflict of interest. Do we know if he actually waved a gun? We only hear one side of the story. This just really did make me feel good that the justice system did what they needed to. We're going to keep following this story and we will have the latest food. Hey there, soulmates. We have an update in the Breonna Taylor case. A Louisville police internal investigation report concluded none of the officers should have fired shots into Taylor's home that night. ABC News obtained newly released documents showing two investigators made this determination, but the report shows these findings were contradicted by Louisville Metro Police Department senior officials. ABC News reports Sergeant Andrew Meyer from the department's professional standards union specifically determined the three officers should have held their gunfire after Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, fired a shot. You'll remember Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron has said the officers were justified in using force because Walker fired a shot. I want to really try to break down this report. So um, this is in the report. They took a total of 32 shots when the provided circumstances made it unsafe to take a single shot. This is how the wrong person was shot and killed. That is what Meyer wrote in this report, according to this ABC News story. And um. Also in the report, specifically breaking down that these officers allegedly violated department use of force policy by ignoring the significant risk of hitting someone who did not pose a threat, which everyone agrees that's exactly right. what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and breaking that down even more, um, they, the report says that the officers should have only used deadly force against the person who presented a deadly threat, which in the officer's words is uh, Kenneth Walker. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so... The problem here is that it wasn't clear. It wasn't clear who you were going to hit exactly. by their circumstances. And so they're saying, you know, why one could understand that you were trying to fire against someone who posed a clear threat. It wasn't clear on where what you were even doing. And so you shouldn't have because there's a risk of shooting someone else, which I saw online took a lot of people back to the shooting of the little girl in Ohio and how mm -hmm. there were two people standing there very close to each other and the officer says, hey, this person was posing a threat to the other, yeah. but could the, the person in pink have also gotten hit? And, and that's been a big conversation as we you know move on, but it, it's just, this has been a conversation back to Breonna Taylor that has been said all along. Everyone had agreed that the wrong person was shot and killed. Now there's just a discussion on whether the officers were right in making that mistake. Yeah, hmm. but they didn't have to go through all this. We all knew that, right? right? If right. you think about it, it was an apartment building. Mm -hmm. So you know so many people are at risk while you're doing that. Where were they going to go if they're shooting at you? How were they going to get out? If you never shot an another bullet into the home, because it was 32 shots, right? At some point, they would have to come out. Mm -hmm. Or you could at least say, we need to clear the building while we make sure they stay inside there. They did this wrong in so many ways. And even if they were in a home and not an apartment, why would you still shoot inside her? Because there could be other people in a home as well. Mm -hmm. Very unfortunate. You know, She'll never get justice. I didn't, I didn't mean to cut in, uh, okay. Romeo. You know, for me, honestly, it doesn't matter for me if it was a house or, or an apartment. Um, you know, Mother's Day was yesterday. I mean, how do you tell a mother that you know, your daughter could still be alive if, if, if a police officer didn't, um, you know, shoot 30, 32 shots alone. Just even hearing that is just insane. Um, but, you know, just a, a Kerry Washington actually put this on Twitter and it really uh, struck a nerve for me because, you know, this news coming out the day after Mother's Day, like after so many people have been, you know, having mixed feelings and mourning even, how do you tell a, a mother that, oh, my, my bad, you know, your daughter could have still been here? Like, that just seems just, I mean, that just alone, just sending a lot of love and prayer to her family, for sure. Yeah, yeah I think that the new findings kind of open up these cops to, um, you know, civil lawsuits, honestly. Um, there's a quote that is said by one of the attorneys, had the officers did what, as they were trained, they would have retreated. Um, and that's a quote from Lenita Baker, an attorney for Taylor's family. Um, according to this investigator, it didn't justify any shots because they couldn't assess the threat, which is absolutely right. 
In addition to that, um, you know, after reading the story, Mattingly, who's one of the cops that wasn't fired, but he has chosen to retire. His mm-hmm. retirement takes effect in June. He's writing a book on the incident. Um, and yeah, so that's going to be a really interesting, um, you know, situation when it happens. I'm kind of hoping that um, he's sued into complete and total submission. Hmm. Anyways, on Sunday, House Majority Whip James Clyburn said he is willing to compromise on qualified immunity to pass a policing reform bill through Congress with bipartisan support. If we don't get qualified immunity now, uh, then uh, we'll come back and try to get it later. But I don't want to see us throw out a good bill uh, because we can't get a perfect bill. Democrats want to do away with qualified immunity, the doctrine that protects state and local government officials, including law enforcement, from liability in civil suits unless they violate a person's clearly established constitutional right. Republicans, however, are advocating for qualified immunity to stay intact. Republican Senator Tim Scott has introduced a counterproposal in the upper chamber dubbed the Justice Act, which covers many of the same areas of concern outlined in the Democrats' bill, including the banning of chokeholds. So an additional quote from James Clyburn um, is, I will never sacrifice good on the altar of perfect. I just won't do that. Um, I know what the perfect bill would be. We've proposed that. We want to see good legislation, and we know that sometimes you have to compromise, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality of the situation is, is that if they don't address qualified immunity, yes. which is a sticking point, if they're not going to get back to it. That's just the point. The same thing can be, uh, you know, the same argument can be used ab- about, um, you know, uh, pre- uh, you know, um, the, the insurrection and Donald J-, Donald J. Trump. Everybody just said, you know, let's just let the election happen and we'll get back to whether or not we're going to hold him accountable if this was a criminal action. And we've all but forgotten about it, you know. And so I'm afraid that the same situation would happen with qualified immunity if they pass the legislation without it. They'll never return to the conversation. Same as the anti-lynching bill. How long has that been a conversation bandied about but never, ever, ever passed? Yeah, you know, I checked in with, you know, a lot of advocates, excuse me, activists pushing for this and and specifically this aspect. And I think a lot of the frustration, at least what I'm uh, pulling together here, is that people feel like this bill is already a compromise. Because you'll remember back last summer when there was a big push to defund the police. A lot of activists were trying to push Democratic lawmakers to look into that. And Jim Clyburn was very vocal saying last June he did not support defunding the police. At that time, he very specifically said that he felt like we needed to reimagine and restructure policing. And so those very activists are saying this is part of that restructuring Mm -hmm. that we've compromised. And also, I think overall you see something. This is not a new frustration. Mm -hmm. Black people being upset with hearing, wait your turn. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of people feel like they're hearing right now. Just just wait your turn. Hold on. We'll get it next time. They feel like this is the next time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Melissa uh, Ms. M- uh, Melissa and Brooke, I know you guys' name. Sorry. Uh, both of <laughs> you actually made a really great point. Melissa, I feel exactly the same way you do. But I don't want to say that I don't feel like we can never address it if we don't address, address it right now. But I feel like it will definitely be much harder uh, to circle back around it with so many things going on in the world right now if we don't address it right now. You have Cori Bush, for example. She doesn't want to move forward. So where they're like, oh, well, Democrats. Democrats are all okay with this. There are some people that still are not okay with um, moving forward without um, qualified immunity being addressed. Like um, Cori Bush, for example, she doesn't want to do anything without qualified immunity being uh, addressed. Of course, we talked about Tim Scott. Well, he wanted just the police department to be uh, held accountable. But Karen Bass, we've talked about her uh, uh, on on the show a lot. She wants the city, the police officer, the police department, everybody, because she feels like if all of these people, if everybody is held accountable, then that way they won't want bad officers, which is what we're saying. That, that's what we're fighting for. We want there to be good police officers, and I feel like we should just handle it right now because, like Melissa said, it, I don't think it's going to never happen, but I feel like it's going to be harder to circle back on it because there's always going to be a new problem coming up. And at the end of the day, I just think a lot of people feel like, you know, would these police officers want to be police officers and really do their job if this happens? Yeah. they really put their so-called life on the line like they're supposed to, so we'll see. All right, a South Carolina city whose population is nearly, t- is nearly two-thirds African-American has elected its first ever all-black 
City Council. Chester voters elected four new members to the City Council on Tuesday, and once they were sworn in, all nine members of the city's governing board were black. The Herald of Rock could report it. According to the Associated Press, about 64% of Chester's uh, population, I'm sorry, 64% is 5,400 people there. Out of 64% out of 5,400 people there. It's Monday. All right, <laughs> the city is several miles off the of interstate, 77 between Columbia and Charlotte, North Carolina. Councilwoman Angela Douglas stated Chester didn't elect its first black council member until 1987 and its first African-American mayor in 1997. The council was made up of eight members, two from each of the city's four wards and the mayor. So I didn't know a lot about Chester, so I said, okay, what is Chester, South Carolina all okay. about? Um, it's known for its hub of railroads dating back to 1851. Uh, on the Sad note, uh, the violent crime and property crime is still very high in that particular city where even though it's only 5,400 people, but I think what's promising is the fact that we have nine members on board, right, to deal with the 64% of the black population in that city. At least we'll have someone that's going to listen and is willing to understand us and make changes. So I do feel good about the city. And congratulations. To yeah. Them. One, you know, wonders why it took so long and, and if, if if everything is on the up and up or if there was some sort of voter suppression happening here, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, because of kind of like the history of when we look at voting rights and who gets to vote and who gets represented, sometimes that's sprinkled in more often than some, I should say, you know. And so, you know, I'm very interested in the history of voting in this small city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at first I used to uh, say to you guys, like, oh, my God, another story of, like, the first black after 170 years. But now I'm rooting for everybody black, and I love to see it. Okay, well, I always was rooting for everybody black. But, you know, now I'm kind of like I'm happy to hear every single story, and let's keep it going. All right, so uh, next story here. Local media and police reported at least nine mass shootings across the country over the weekend. That combined left at least 15 people dead and 30 more wounded, according to CNN, and an analysis of data from the Gun Violence Archive. This weekend's shootings provide a glimpse into the rise in violence that began last year and has continued ever since. Criminology experts have pointed to a perfect storm of factors, including economic collapse, COVID-19's severing of social uh, connections, as well as white supremacy. So um, as you guys know, you know, a mass shooting is uh, four or more people being shot or injured. And so 142 mass shootings have taken place since Biden's 100 days in office. And so I feel like this is why uh, Biden is taking gun control so very seriously, which I'm happy about. Um, I forgot exactly which mass shooting it was where he made that announcement right after where he was like, hey, I'm taking this serious. I'm hopping on it. Um, also, so one of the measures that Biden wanted to hop in um, and, and add in, excuse me, is that he wanted to alert a law enforcement when someone fails a federal background check. So that was what kind of be a way uh, when someone's maybe buying, they call it ghost guns, like a gun that doesn't have a serial number and that would alert law enforcement like, hey, this person failed a background check. They're trying to buy a gun. And um, that would hopefully, you know, slow the process of guns getting into, you know, bad people, of course, people, people who have records. So, uh, you know, I'm just happy. I know I wrapped Joe Biden's story into there, but I'm just happy that Joe Biden is getting on top of this gun control issue because because they're also, excuse me, was a 12-year-old girl that got shot this weekend in Chicago. I mean, literally, I wrote down all of them, but we don't even need to because, I mean, all across the world, this was just some. There were, like, still shootings that ran across, you know, the world with people, you know, children. Yeah, and it's kind of like we have to get this gun control under under control. Yeah. Mm. Even from New York to Colorado Springs, the seven people that killed in Colorado Springs, yeah. Freddie Marquez, he was there with his wife and kids. They left early because his wife had to work the next day. But his <laughs> wife lost her mother two brothers and three extended family members. I feel like every week we're, we're, we're hearing a story of a family that has such a major loss. And if you think about over the years, all the way back to Columbine, like this has been ongoing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I respect President Biden saying, look, I, I'm, I'm tired of this, we gotta make change. But I always feel like we hit a wall when we get to a certain point yeah. and we get stuck. There's a reason for that. Yeah, okay. and that's what frustrates us. Yeah, it's like the look on my face basically just says that there's never going to be any meaningful change. I mean, it's, it's a very, you know, pessimistic way of looking at things. But as long as the NRA is such a powerful, basically, institution and they have powerful lobbyists and they have an enormous access to funds to constantly line the pockets of politicians, that corruption is never going to allow for significant and meaningful change to take place when it comes to guns and the Second Amendment, in this country at least. Every other country has a, a meaningful, significant uh, form of gun control.
America is completely different because they keep on reaching for the Second Amendment of the Constitution that was written how many hundreds of years ago when our life expectancy was 38 years old and when our average neighbor was four or 10 miles down the road and we had to protect ourselves from you know, from 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 robbers and that sort of thing. Like we can't apply stuff that 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 was reality for us in 1776 to 2021. But that's what continues to happen. You know, it'll be interesting to see um, what aspect of this or, or, or how how much we get to see of Congresswoman Lucy McBath out of Georgia. You know, obviously, gun control is very important to her. She's very passionate about this. Is Jordan Davis's mother, and there has been so much talk about so many other things that this country is facing right now, specifically the pandemic, which is understandably so. But it will be interesting with this new administration and obviously new control of Congress and the Senate together, newly controlling both. Obviously, new control of Congress is not new, but um, of the House, excuse me. But it will be interesting to see what we get to see from her. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's check in really quick with our YouTube soulmates here. Sophia wants